This is part four of the video series on Joseph as we continue on the pathway to Jesus. Uh, we're going to pick up the story here in Genesis, the 46th chapter. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will be there. Uh, make of thee a great nation. And I will go down with thee into Egypt. And I will also surely bring thee up again. Uh, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thy eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they are all, all of them, are going uh, from Hebron, the land of Canaan, into Egypt. Everybody, nobody's being left. Uh, don't forget that there's five more years uh, of this terrible famine. And uh, the famine, of course, is the wrath of God. Do you understand? Uh, anyway, verse 6. And they took their cattle and their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with them his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. And I'm not going to read all their names. Uh, it's just the genealogy of, of and explaining who's, who are the family members. Of course, it's going to list all the 12 sons of Israel, and of course their kids too, and uh, their, their sons. And so we're going to pick up the story uh, in verse 26. And all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, uh, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were threescore and six, sixty-six. And, and, uh, the sons of Joseph, uh, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls, all the souls. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. So that would be seventy. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen to pre and presented himself to him. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a great while. Could you imagine? Joseph, uh, is according from his father's per uh, perception, has been dead for 20-some years. Do you understand? To see his son after 20-some years, and not only just to see him after 20 years, after he thought he had been dead for 20 years, from his perception, it is most like a resurrection. He came back from the dead. That's another similarity, see, of Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus Christ came back from the dead. He arose and uh, he was resurrected. So there's that similarity, too. And uh, that's why Joseph is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, a Savior. Anyway, verse 30. And Israel uh, said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. 
He wanted to he wanted to stay even though he's really old. He wanted to stay alive long enough to see that son, Joseph, the son he favored, the son who he made the coat of many colors. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his family, uh, father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say to him, my brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are coming to me. And and the men are shepherds, for their trade has been fed uh, to feed cattle. They have, they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? And you shall say, Thy servant's trade has been about cattle from our youth until now, both we and our fathers, that we may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Do you see what's going on here? Joseph is telling them, tell the Pharaoh that you're all shepherds, because the Egyptians think shepherds are a lower form of living. They have nothing to do with the shepherds. They just think they're just an abomination. The Egyptians think themselves a higher class of people. You understand? So what, why is he doing this? Why is Joseph telling him to say you're shepherds? And don't forget the Pharaoh had told Joseph to tell them, don't even bring your flocks. Don't bring your, uh, your stuff. We have plenty for you. But they ended up bringing their flocks anyway. Why is this? Because Joseph wanted the Hebrews, his people, and his, you know his father's people, to all live in one specific area and be together that they might worship God in their own traditions and in their own way and carry on the, the you know the, the token of the covenant, the circumcision for the males after eight days of being a, 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 a past birth and carry on all the traditions of the Hebrews. Do you understand? They wanted to be by themselves. They did not want to be integrated with the hierarchy of uh, the Egyptians. And, how, and why was that important? Because Joseph uh, was a very wise person. He rose to the level to be second only to the Pharaoh. Now the Pharaoh must think, oh, not only is it Joseph his wives, we have more of his brothers. We can put him, well, maybe we can put him into high positions over the land of uh, the Egyptians and they can rule. That isn't what Joseph wanted for his family. He wanted them to be separate in the land of Goshen and Egypt and so they could worship God, not worship the Pharaoh and his higher class of people. So it was a very wise thing he was trying to do. So he's saying Tell the Pharaoh you're uh, shepherds because they don't like shepherds. They think very low of the shepherds, you understand? And that way we can just stay together and be together and nobody will bother us about being integrated into the hierarchy of Egyptian rule. So it was a very smart thing to do. That is the end of chapter 46. To chapter uh, 47. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren and even five men and presented it them to, unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said it to his brethren, What is your occupation? See, Joseph knew that he would ask that question. And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. So, could you imagine the, the situation here? The Pharaoh's thinking, Oh, you're a bunch of shepherds. Great. <laughs> okay. But that's exactly what they wanted, see. And uh, uh, they, more, they said moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land, are we come? For thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. 
Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. See that the as I've said earlier, uh, to the famine certainly is the judgment of God. It is the wrath of God for an unco- ungodly and wicked people in the world. Do you understand? But but it's a it's a uh, you know the wise people uh, went to look for water or, or went to look for a better place to live that wasn't suffering from the famine. You understand? They survived. The ones that weren't too wise, that just said, well, we'll just stick it out and see what happens. I'm sure they all starved to death. Do you understand? Because certainly a famine means the death of all their livestock. You can't grow crops because there's no rain. Do you understand? It is certainly, it is the wrath of God. But don't forget God is multidimensional. It's not just for one reason. The famine's not for one reason. It's also to drive and to motivate the Hebrew people to get up, get out of Hebron, the land of Canaan, and go to Egypt. Do you understand? Don't forget God had told Abraham when Abraham was in a deep sleep. He told him that your descendants would be slaves for 400 years. So this is all coming true. Now, you you have to keep in mind that that story had to be taught to all of Abraham's kids and then their kids and their kids. Certainly, they had to be aware of the possibility of why are we going to Egypt? Do you remember Abraham, our forefather, said that we would be slaves someday? Do you understand? Certainly, they might have thought that this is this is it. We may be slaves soon. <laughs> they might have had thoughts like that. But at the present moment, they're not slaves. So this obviously going to Egypt is saving their lives. Going to Egypt means we're all going to live. Our children. It was just a rational decision. It was, but it was forced by the famine, see? Uh, so my God is multidimensional. When he does something, it's for more than one reason. Anyway, verse uh, 5, And Pharaoh spoke unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are coming to thee. The land of Egypt is before you. In the best of the land, make thy father and thy brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, uh, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any man of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. Okay, if... If you're going to be shepherds, I want you to take care of my cattle. He he must, the Pharaoh had to have a high opinion of them, even though they thought the shepherds were a, a lower life uh, kind of people. But he still must have esteemed them to, uh, more than the, uh, better than the average shepherd, I guess is what I want to say. He certainly did. He's like, okay, if you're going to be shepherds, take care of my cows because... Obviously, your brother Joseph's a very wise and diligent person. Perhaps he came from a family of very wise and diligent uh, uh, brothers and father and everything. So, so I think it was in his best interest to make him rulers over his specific cattle too. Uh, anyway, uh, verse seven. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Isn't that something? Jacob, a godly man, is going to a foreign country, do you understand? And he's blessing uh, uh, the leader of that country. It's very diplomatic, but very it comes very natural for him to bless people because he was raised a godly person. And uh and Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of my years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh and Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, 
in the land of Ramses as Pharaoh had commanded. So even though they're shepherds, they're, you know, in this lower, <laughs> lower life type of people, from the Pharaoh's point of view, the Egyptians, they're still going to get in a very favorable part of the Egypt where, it, uh, you know, they're going to thrive because the land is not suffering apparently from the famine in that area. Uh, you know, it's uh, as harshly as the rest of the world, do you understand? And anyway, in uh, verse 12, And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. Joseph's taking care of his whole family, all of them. Do you understand? Seventy-some people. And uh, he loves them all, I'm sure. And he's probably uh, overjoyed to meet them all, too, especially the kids. And uh, at that time, if you look, you'll, you'll find out that uh, uh, there was a lot of kids. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into the Pharaoh's house. And when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth us this money is no good to us we we have we need food this and that's what a famine does money is doesn't mean anything anymore it's all about having food and water the basic uh, essential things for human survival so uh, and joseph said give us your cattle and i will and i will give for your cattle if the money fail and they brought their cattle unto joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, for the flocks, for the cattle of the herds, for the asses. He fed them with bread for all the cattle that year. And when the year was ended, they came unto him a second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord has also have our herds of cattle. There is none aught left in my, the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. We've, we've given you all our cattle in exchange for food and, and water, I, I assume, too. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, there's nothing left except the land that we own and us, our, our, our bodies. <laughs> Wherefore shall we uh, die before thy eyes, both we and our land, Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto the Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for the Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. And as for thy people, he removed them to the uh, cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even unto the other end of it thereof. So they're all coming to the city. And it's because the, uh, Joseph bought up all their land in exchange for food. They gave them their cattle for food. Now they're given their land for food. So now they all have to move into the city. Only the land of the priest uh, bought he not, for the priest had a portion assigned them of the Pharaoh and did eat their portion, which the Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore, they sold not their land. So everybody is selling their land except for the priest, uh, the Egyptian priest. Then Joseph said unto his people, Behold, I have bought you this day in your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is the seed for you that you shall sow the land, and it shall, shall come to pass in the increase that you give 
uh, the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own. For the seed of thy field, and for your food of them of your households, and for the food of your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Hear what I just said? Thou hast saved our lives. So truly, Joseph is living up to the name the Pharaoh gave him, Zapanath Paneah. Okay, and he truly is the savior of the world at that time. Okay, they came to him and gave up everything so they could live. Sound familiar? It's exactly like Jesus Christ, the one and true savior. Do you understand? Come to him that you might live and be forgiven of all your sins. Do you understand? That you may live. These uh, uh, material possessions don't add up to anything. You know, the, the life is never was never meant as some sort of race to see who can get the most money, to see who can get the most material possessions. Those are people of this world, and I guarantee you, they all go down the same path that Solomon went down. I will make me mansions. I, I, let me put it in modern day English. I will buy myself yachts and mansions and fancy expensive cars, airplanes and helicopters. You understand? Whatever people, uh, scientists and whoever can make, I will buy it. And therefore, I will be happy after I have all these great things. Some people still do the same thing that Solomon did. And they're going to, they think they're going to come out with some other conclusion than Solomon. They're not. Solomon said that that kind of uh, path to go on uh, after money and material possessions will leave you feeling empty. It will never satisfy you. But a lot of people don't listen to, to common sense. They don't listen to his wisdom. Do you understand? They still want to go down that path thinking I'll have a, I'll be happy. I'll be different than that other person. I'll be satisfied. They're on a treadmill is what I call it. A treadmill. They're they're walking, then they're running, but they're never getting anywhere because it's an artificial path. The real path in life is the one that leads you to God, our Father, and that is the one that leads you to Jesus Christ. Do you understand? No man cometh to the Father but through Jesus Christ. That's the path you should be on, not this path of these temporary things in this world. You know, it's all an illusion. Do you understand? It's all a waste of time. Do you understand? It truly is. But many, 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 many people are still on that path. Do you understand? They still want to go on that path. It's crazy. Do you understand? You're not going to take anything with you, as they say. You're, you're just not. The only thing you're going to take with you is how you treated people, how you loved people or hated people. Those are the things God's going to judge. He's certainly not going to care about your mansion for your fancy car, do you understand? He might be interested in what uh, what you did with the little money you had. Did you spend it all on yourself or did you help anybody with it? Do you understand? Money is made to help people. It's in the Bible. Do you understand? He explains what money is for. Money is to help, uh, to have, to help those in need, period. Uh, this self-indulgence uh, for your, for yourself is very narcissistic and it just leads to uh, emptiness. You'll end up being by yourself and never happy. You know, as a child, uh, here's what children like to do. Children like to share things that they have. They don't say, that, you know, this is mine, you can't play with it. Those are awful ones. <laughs> That's an awful thing to do. What I'm trying to say is even as a child, you like to help people. You like to give to someone. That's what makes you happy as a kid. That should stay with you the rest of your life. You understand? The little kid inside of you should still be like that. Anyway, um, certainly they didn't. Uh, uh, the Egyptians had given up everything they owned, including their land. It was a good time for the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh was becoming wealthier. He was becoming the biggest landowner in Egypt, but it wasn't uh, done by him. It was done by his golden goose, his his right-hand man, a Hebrew from Canaan, 
a Hebrew from Hebron, Joseph. Without Joseph discerning the dreams years ago, this would have never happened. But Pharaoh has high esteem for him and his family. <clears throat> but that's going to change. As we're going to move on into Exodus, you're going to find out uh, that the next Pharaoh has nothing to do with Joseph, doesn't even know him, nor, nor cares to know him. Anyway, uh, without jumping too far ahead of the story here, uh, we look at uh, verse 26. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have a fifth part except the land of the priest only, which became not the Pharaoh's. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen. They had their uh, possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147, 147 years old. That's incredible, even for back then. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. He called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. Swear to me, please swear to me, that if when I die, you'll take me back, my body, back to the cave of Machpelia, where my forefathers are, are buried, uh, the cave that Abraham bought. And... Uh, in verse 30, but I will lie uh, with my fathers that thou shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. Joseph saying, I will do it. I will fulfill your dying wish. And he said, swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. And the only comment I want to make is that is the end of chapter 47 is do you recall that uh, Joseph had a, two dreams. The second dream, father and mother, along with the 11 brothers, bowed down to him. His father just bowed down to him. Joseph, his son, that would be unheard of, really. It's usually the other way around. But that did fulfill that dream, too. uh -huh. As we move along here to uh, Genesis chapter 48. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told uh, Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph come unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And I and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a, a multitude of people, and I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy uh, two sons, Ephraim and uh, Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came into, thee, into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simon, they shall be mine. And thy issue, which begatst after them, shall be mine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance." As for me, when I came from Pandan, uh, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way. And yet there was but a little way to come to Aphrath. And I buried her there in the way of Aphrath. And the same is Bethlehem. So Rachel was indeed buried in Bethlehem and, uh, and not uh, in the cave of Machpelia. 
because if you remember, they were coming back from the Fertile Crescent from up north, and uh, that's when uh, she gave delivery to Benjamin and, of course, died while giving birth to Benjamin on their way back home, essentially. And, and Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee unto me, and I will bless them. So Jacob is going to bless his grandsons, essentially. And and he says, Now the eyes of, uh, uh, verse 10, And now the eyes of Israel were dim for his age, that he could not see clearly, obviously. And he brought them near to him and kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God has showed me also thy seed. Not only did I, uh, I get to see you again, I also got to see your children, your two sons. And Joseph brought them from out between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. So the children had to be pretty young if they were kind of hiding behind their daddy's legs, which children uh, do all the time. And uh, so they had to be pretty young. And uh, Joseph took them both, Ephraim, uh, in his right hand towards Israel's left, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel. L's right hand, and he brought them near to him. Why did he do that? He was lining them up to put the firstborn, which was Manasseh, uh, uh, in front of Jacob's right hand, because his right hand was the, one, the hand to be used to bless people. So he was the firstborn. He put him right in front of his right hand, and he put uh, Ephraim uh, in front of his left. And he's going to do something here that is mystifies. Uh, everyone. Anyway, uh, and Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's uh, head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittily, for Manasseh was the firstborn. In other words, he was doing it on purpose. It wasn't by accident. He actually crossed his arm, see? He put his right hand on the youngest one instead of the firstborn, which you're going to find out. Joseph is upset at that and can't figure out why he's doing it. And uh, he, he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long until this very day, the angel which redeem me from all evil, bless the lads, let my name be named on them, the name of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head onto Manasseh's head. He was actually, because his father, don't forget, his father uh, was old and he, you know, he couldn't see. He was, for, the, for all intents and purposes, blind. So his, Joseph was trying to help him, really. But J, uh, Israel, Jacob, is his father is saying, no, no, I know what I'm doing. Okay, this is on purpose. But it still mystified him. And, uh, verse 18, And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused. <laughs> he, he put his foot down. I know what I'm doing, and you're not going to stop this. And, and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. 
Uh, and he blessed them that day, saying, In thee, Israel, bless, saying, God, make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim uh, before Manasseh. Okay. Anyway, uh, we'll stop there and say, and I try to explain this. Why is he doing that? If you were to Google why uh, Jacob blessed Ephraim instead of Manasseh, you're going to get about, I don't know, three, five million different answers, <laughs> which concludes me that nobody really knows. See, it's a great mystery. But don't forget, God is a mystery. He doesn't, God certainly doesn't explain everything to us because we, we the Bible would be uh, way too long for us to even get through, see. He doesn't explain every little thing. And God still is a mystery. And God still is sovereign. Do you understand? In other words, God can do things uh, for his own reasons that are unknown to us. And they remain unknown to us. Certainly, Jacob Israel was being led of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, the, the Holy Spirit within him. Now, what I want to explain is... It, the Holy Spirit within Jacob. Jacob has his own free will. The Holy Spirit uh, really, uh, it's hard to say if the Holy Spirit has a will that uh, that uh, controls or takes over Jacob. That can't be the case because God is love and love does not push to get its own way. It doesn't. Certainly, Jacob had something to do with what he was doing. And some of the things I'd like to uh, uh, say are, don't forget that Jacob himself was a second born. He was the younger of the two uh, between Jacob and Esau. You remember the story, of course, uh, and I'm not going to explain it all, but it, uh, you know, his brother Esau could have cared less about his first, uh, his firstborn rights. He mocked God. He mocked God's system of, uh, of you know, of power and uh, positions, I should say, that the, the firstborn by natural birth is more like his mother and father than everybody. And, and once he can a actually uh, speak for his father when he's doing business with people, it's only the firstborn that can do this. When he, when the, when the father uh, dies, he takes over the family. His mother can still be alive, but now he is the patriarch. You understand? And, uh, so that certainly probably had something to do with why Jacob did this, because he must have saw, obvious, that Esau, the firstborn, could have cared less. He didn't care about his, his first, uh, his birthright, nor did he care about the, uh, responsibility of that uh, birthright. It's not fun and games. You, 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 you are now the one that decides everything and essentially you become the head of the kingdom of God on earth. Do you understand? It's, and Jacob took it very seriously and Jacob stayed around the tents. He's a tent dweller, uh, which means he learned all the valuable lessons from his father and attained and retained the knowledge of God. Uh, and and that's and by nature or, or, or his natural desire, this is what he loved. He loved to be taught the things of God. And clear back to creation of Adam and Eve, Noah, the great flood, you know, the, all of it, uh, up to this very day uh, when he was uh, took over uh, being the head of the kingdom of uh, God on earth. Do you understand? So he must have thought that. It doesn't matter if it's the firstborn, because the firstborn could not even like uh, the responsibility. He could mock God. Certainly my brother did. So there was that part of Jacob. Perhaps he thought as he went through, he took the role more seriously and thought, I must be special because this hasn't happened. The, the younger has never gotten the firstborn uh, uh, rights. It's not that he was special. It's maybe he was more... Uh, he was a better candidate. So certainly he had that going for him when he did this. He must have had, uh, had this background of actually happening to himself. So maybe that played a part in why he did it. But because he's filled with the Holy Ghost, it's also God's will too, see? 
So the, their two wills could have merged, and, and God knows the future, right? He thought this is a better candidate. He's being led of the Holy Spirit, but also, you know, if he was all the, if he was nothing more than the Holy Spirit, he'd be God. Being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean uh, that that person's will disappears or that person, their personality and everything else is gone. That they're just this vessel. That part of that vessel is themselves. Do you understand? With the Spirit of God within that person. I hope that it's hard to explain spiritual things, but I hope that helps understand what's taking place. You know, if you if you think this was a God wouldn't have wanted this, that's not the case. You understand? He certainly wanted to make Jacob happy. God does. God loves uh, Jacob. You understand? It's a, a matter of love, and it's a matter of will too. And uh, I guess one other thing is God knows the future. See, he, he, certainly God must have agreed with Jacob that the, this younger boy is going to be grow up to be the man that is going to be a better candidate. But it's still a mystery. We certainly there's no clear and concise answer to why he did this. I'm just throwing out some of my own opinions about it. Anyway, uh, verse 21, And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given on to thee one portion above my brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite, with my sword and my bow. And that's the end of Genesis chapter 48. Obviously, Joseph uh, is getting the firstborn uh, things that should have went to Reuben, see? But he's getting a double portion of the inheritance uh, of, of Jacob, Israel's death, see? Anyway, as we move on to Genesis chapter 49. Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall on you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Who does that sound like is talking? Does that sound like... Uh, that is Jacob speaking. He says, you sons of Jacob, hearken unto Israel, your father. Doesn't exactly sound like what a father would say. It sounds like God is speaking through Jacob, is what I'm trying to say. You know, I'll say it once more time. Gather yourselves together and hear, you sons of Jacob, hearken unto Israel, your father certainly sounds like God speaking. But it's a Holy Spirit speaking through Jacob. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. Okay, now it's Jacob speaking. See, <laughs> that's what I was trying to explain before. It's a mixture of the Holy Spirit and the person himself. See, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dig dignity, the excellency of power, unstable as water. Uh, thou shall not excel, because thou wentest up uh, to thy father's bed, then defile uh, thou it. He went up to my couch. Uh, Simon and Levi are brethren. These are the two that killed uh, the ones that they thought that Dinah, their sister, was raped by. Not only the man that did it, their whole clan. And it caused Jacob a, a big headache. Uh, there, all these people that knew that clan you killed are all going to get together and kill us now. Not a wise thing to do what you did. So they took off up north and they stayed up there for who knows how long. A couple of years perhaps. I don't know. Long enough where they felt that these people had forgotten about it. We can go back now. Uh, so these are the two brothers that had murdered instruments of cruelty are in their habitations O oh, my soul come thou come not thou into their secret unto their assembly my honor 
be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now who sounds like it's speaking? You have, to, you, have to, you have to look in the details of what's being said here. It says, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Sounds more like God than Jacob. <laughs> okay. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, as an old lion who shall ruse him up. The scepter, the scepter shall not pass, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh. Uh, Come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass his colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth with milk. Zebulun shall dwell in the haven of the sea, he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be uh, unto Zidon. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between, between two burdens. And he saw the rest was good, and the land that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto tribute. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heel, heel so that his rider shall fall backwards. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Now that's definitely Jacob speaking. Gad, a troop shall overcome him but he shall overcome at the last out of asher his breath shall be his bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties naphtali is a hind let loose he giveth goodly works joseph is a fruitful bowl even a fruitful bowl by a well whose branches run over the wall the arches uh, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made uh, strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And then, of course, uh, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, uh, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee by the almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above blessings of the deep that lieth under blessings of the breast of the womb the blessings of thy father have prevailed above blessings the blessings of my of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of everlasting ills they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of his, the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Benjamin shall be a, uh, shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey and at night he shall divide the spoil. Now that's a lot of uh, things were, were said there and it is the Holy Spirit and Jacob as one. God and Jacob as one, see. And uh, certainly I, I tried to point out some of the uh, hints to who was speaking. You can see that it's 
it's a, it's hard to decipher, but I'm trying to tell you that it's both God and Jacob, you know, the Holy Spirit and Jacob uh, uh, doing this. And uh, he certainly was filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and most of it is beyond understanding, see, and for good reason, see, it. I'm, cer I'm certain that all his sons were paying very close attention, and especially when their name was mentioned. And for years, I'm sure it it stuck with them. See, the blessing from their father of what he said meant something to them as their life opened up, you know, as they got older, you understand? And certainly when it, they figured it out, the great mystery of what's being said for each particular uh, son. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is it that their father spoken to them and blessed them. Everyone, according to his blessing, he blessed them. At verse 29, and he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, uh, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. In verse 33, And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet unto his bed. In other words, he was sitting up when he was blessed, and now he's back to laying down on his bed, and yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. Isn't that something? He blessed them, and when he was done blessing them, he gave up the ghost and died. That had to be such a moment that I can't relate to that, or, you know, uh, you know, people do say things just before they die in hospitals and in and, uh, and situations like that. But what a thing to be blessed by their father. And uh, they couldn't even ask questions like, what did you say? What did that mean? <laughs> do you understand? He gave up the ghost. and that, But that's the beautiful mystery of God, see? Uh, is, and that's why these things were said almost in a poetic way. It's almost poetry. That it's being said at a, and things at a higher level than what is our own understanding. You understand? It, so you know it's it has to be from God. This the, oh, what is he saying? It's it's hard to understand it. But at some point, as they grew older, maybe God revealed to them what it meant. You know, uh, as years progress for each son. See, it's a great mystery. Uh, some of it's plain, uh, plain speaking, but some of it is very elevated, like I said, uh, almost poetry. Very hard to discern. A great mystery, but it comes from a, a loving God, see. Genesis chapter 50, and this is the last chapter of uh, Genesis uh, before we get to Exodus and uh, what a story of the great patriarchs. One of the things I did want to say, I guess I might as well say it right here, is uh, think of the word patriot, uh, patriarchs, and matriarchs. Patriarchs means the male who is the top person in a large clan of people, a large family. Matriarch is the female that's the, the one that's way up at the top of uh, the clan or family, so you have patriarch for the for the uh, the top male, matriarch for the top female. Now, when you put grand in front of each word, grand patriarch or grand matriarch, okay. And I'll put this up. 
Look at the first two letters of each word, patriarch and matriarch. The two uh, first letters are PA for patriarch and MA for matriarch. What am I getting at? Put grand in front of the grand patriarch, grand PA, grand PA, grand uh, matriarch, grand MA, grand MA. So that's where the words grandpa comes from. And the words grandma is grand patriarch and grand matriarch. But it's been shortened into the English slang in America, especially to mean grandpa, grandma. Grand, who wants to call their grandfather grand patriarch? Hey, grand patriarch. <laughs> they shorten it to grandpa. And then grandma, grand, or grand patriarch, uh, I'm sorry, grand matriarch to grandma. Uh, so I, that's just an interesting uh, a little uh, tidbit of uh, trivia, uh, but it has, uh, you know, words, uh, it has a very uh, eloquent meaning to it, you know, to be called not just patriarch, you're called the grand patriarch, you're really the top dog, you understand, the top male and the female uh, grand matriarch. Anyway, it's a little trivia. Uh, Genesis, uh, the 50th chapter, and Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And, of course, this was an Egyptian tradition. They, they, they figured out how to uh, embalm a, a physical body. So this was a... a, a uh, an Egyptian tradition when someone dies, certainly not a Hebrew tradition. Anyway, uh, and 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days uh, which are embalmed, and the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days, 70 days. And when the days of his mourning were passed, Joseph spoke unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I am dying in the, my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. Um, there shall, uh, shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And the Pharaoh said, Go up, bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh. Isn't that something? That was had to be quite a uh, large amount of people and quite a trip, you know. This is in the days of uh, horses and asses, and I, I would assume camels had to be quite the trip to go to the cave of Machpelia. And with this large amount of not just the Hebrews, the Egyptians that were paying respect to him because of Joseph. And uh, the, it says the elders of his house and all the elders of the land of Egypt, incredible amount of people. And all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones, their flocks, their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. As I said, probably unheard of since then. The, just the volume of people over Joseph's father, Jacob, Israel. And... Um, they came to the threshing floor of Atad, uh, which is beyond Jordan, and they mourned with a great and very sore uh, lamentations. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. This is quite a funeral. Unheard of. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, 
they set, uh, of course, the floor would be the valley. <laughs> you know, it's, they saw this great amount of people in this flat valley. This is a great morning to the Egyptians, wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he uh, commanded them. Verse 13, for his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the uh, with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned unto Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren, this is an important verse here, this next section, Verse 15, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us now and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did to him. Now that our father is dead, Joseph's going to get even with us for what we did years ago to him. They still have this lingering uh, fear. You know, think of all the fear they've been through throughout all of this the fear of being a slave, the fear of going to prison, rightfully so because of what they did to Joseph. I mean, they w we were going to murder him. Given the fact that Simon and Levi had murdered men before, there was a high level of uh, anxiety for some of the brothers that they're actually, these, these guys are actually going to kill Joseph. And that certainly is why Judah found a different thing to do because he knew at least two of those brothers would actually murder because they had already done it before. Anyway, verse 16, And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. The big moment of repentance right here. See, forgive us. They're actually saying the words, forgive us. See, finally, they finally are uh, coming to that point of saying they're sorry to them, which is a big moment. I mean, this is like you coming to Jesus, see, and saying you're sorry for all the wrong things you've done. Do you understand? For the things that you didn't even know were wrong. For the things that you did know were wrong and did them anyway. Do you understand? They certainly knew what they had done was wrong. Do you understand? It's just exactly the same. See, that similarity. They're coming to him for redemption. They're coming to him for salvation. Do you understand? They're coming to him to be cleansed of the burden of guilt and regret that they carried all those years during those, that course of the last 20 years. Because don't kid yourself, most of them must have felt bad after they grew up and became mature men of what happened. And they certainly thought maybe he's dead because slaves probably don't last that long in Egypt. So it was a big deal. Anyway, for they, uh, for they did... For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of our father. And Joseph wept. They finally got to that point where they're saying, I'm sorry. And it was sincere. You understand? But certainly it was driven by fear a little bit, but it was also probably driven by love, love and fear. You can love God and fear God at the same time, believe me. <laughs> you understand? I had a love and fear of my father when I was young. You know, I loved him, but I also was a little afraid of him because he would spank us. Do you understand? So you can certainly love and fear someone at the same time. And the fear of God is a very healthy thing, by the way. It is. It's, it's a fear of consequences of what you're doing, see. Fear of having to answer for what you've done and said, see. That's a healthy fear. 
That's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of understanding. Anyway, they say uh, they're asking for forgiveness. They send a messenger kind of before them, but as he's telling them, they all come into the room and say they're sorry face to face. And Joseph cried, and his brother, his brethren also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we be thy servants. They, they, they matured. They, we deserve this for what we did to you. Uh, we don't deserve uh, anything, really, but we are here at your mercy, and, at, and we are here at your grace. Your, the thing that's keeping us alive is your grace and your mercy. Certainly, Joseph had forgiven them before they came to him for forgiveness. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. And that really is the one scripture that overwrites and overarcs this whole uh, story that's been going on for chapters about how Joseph ended up in Egypt, see, Joseph came to the conclusion far before they did and forgave them because why? Because what you did to me uh, was an evil thing, but God meant it to be good. He meant for me to be in Egypt. He meant for me and being a power. Why? Okay, because I saved your lives. I saved my family's lives. I went through all the the suffering, you understand, before I got to the elevated position. And I'm here, I was here to save you. Who does that sound like? Who suffered before they went to the cross and died and was resurrected and sits at the right hand of God? Do you understand? And has the power to what? To save you, see? That is the overarching story of all this. What you see is maybe going through struggles in life and everything. You don't see farther down the road. Do you understand? You don't see the possibilities. I should put it this way. You don't see the possibilities of what could be with God farther down the road. All you know is what's going on at this present moment. At this present moment, I'm suffering. I've had it with this life. I want to die. I want to end my life, maybe. Do you understand? You can't see uh, the possibilities of what could be. But God can. Do you understand? God can. God can turn what you think is all the horrible things that are going on with you, your suffering. He can turn it into something beautiful. And if you don't think that God can do that, you don't know God. See? Anyway, here's one story of one man, Joseph. That's one story. One story about one man, Joseph, and the suffering he went through. The same thing could happen to you, do you understand? Anyway, the rest of that verse, of course, is, I'll read the whole thing over again. But as for you, you thought it was evil. You thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive, to save people, to save my family. But not just to save my people. I'm here. I also save people that are not my people. Who, who did Jesus come to save? His own people, the Jewish people. And what is God's great gift? Salvation for the rest of the world. The big, uh, what might have been a big surprise to uh, the Jews is Jesus not only became the Savior for them, he's the Savior for all of us, the rest of the world. So you see the similarities between Joseph and Jesus? Joseph, saved, I'll say it again, saved his own, and he saved people that weren't his own. Jesus came into the world to save his own, and also all Gentiles, see. 
verse 21. Now, therefore, fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly unto them. There was a big, incredible moment for all of them. The gentle, uh, kind, gracious, uh, forgiving nature of Joseph. Do you understand? But don't think for a moment he went through a living hell. He, I, I have no doubt in my mind that he wanted to uh, exact revenge on his brothers at, at points in his life, perhaps when he was in prison for 12 years. Don't kid yourself. He went through all the emotions to come to the place of forgiving them. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't. You understand? It's not talked about in the Bible, but it's all there. He went through all of it. Anger, uh, re, re, you know, uh, just resentment towards him, a uh, bitterness towards him. Do you understand? But as the years went by, you know, it, it's, he forgave them. Do you understand? He figured it out. That it was as long as I have God with me, it doesn't matter what I go through. See? That's what he figured out. That's what you should know as a Christian. As long as you have Jesus, as long as you have our Father, God Almighty, uh, you're going to be okay. Do you understand? It matters not what you go through. See? You'll go through it with him. He'll never leave you. See? He'll stay with you through all uh, the good times, the bad times. Do you understand? He's always with you. That's a very comforting uh, thought, you understand? Certainly, like I said, Joseph came to that place. doesn't matter what I've been through. He's with me. God is with me. I can't see the future of what's going to happen. But, but then it all did merge uh, into him saving him because of the famine. Certainly, Joseph had no knowledge of the famine until uh, he spoke to the Pharaoh and his dream. So it came from by somebody else, just not Joseph. And anyway, we have a few more verses here. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived uh, to be 110 years old. When all this was taking place here, he was about 40, 41, 42, somewhere in there. So it's another, basically another 70 years he lived in Egypt. And uh Verse 23, And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machar, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. Verse 24, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land. Listen to what he's saying now as he, before he dies. God is going to bring you all up out of this land, which he swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. Uh, so Joseph died a hundred uh, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, I have to, a few little comments I want to make is listen to what he's telling them. Uh, and you shall carry my bones from thence. I'm not going to stay here. I want my bones to go back home in uh, the land of Canaan. Do you understand? And if you know anything about the Bible, that did happen under when Moses led the children to the promised land, they took Joseph's bones with them. See? And so that did happen. And the point I want to make is Joseph, once again, as his forefathers, is filled with the Holy Spirit. You understand? And that's why he's, uh, he's able to say these things unto him. Uh, you should carry his prophesying, see? And it did come true, is my point, see? Moses made sure that his uh, bones came out of uh, Egypt and went to his homeland. 
That is the end of Genesis. Genesis, one of the longest books in the Bible. It's quite a journey. And uh, we're gonna comp- I'm going to now compare uh, with uh, a list here of the similarities between Joseph and Jesus. Jerusalem, if I forget you, if I am not gonna come from my tongue. Jerusalem, if I forget you, let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do. Jerusalem, if I forget you, if I am not gonna come from my tongue. Jerusalem, if I forget you, oh, oh. In all the ancient days, we will return with no delay. Picking up the bounty and the spoils on our way Said that we've been traveling up from a state to stay And I don't understand now what they say Three thousand years with no place to be And I'm on us to give up our milk and honey Don't you see? Not about the land or the sea Not a country but the dwelling of His Majesty Jerusalem, if I forget you If I am not gone, come from my tongue Jerusalem, if I forget you let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do to Jerusalem. If I forget you, oh, by your knock on compromise on Jerusalem. If I forget you, oh, oh. rebuild the temple and the crown of glory. Years gone by, about 60. We were burned in the oven in a century. And the gas tried to choke, but it couldn't choke me. Would not fall down and would not fall asleep. So them come overseas. I'm trying to be free. Erase the demons out of your memory. Change your name and your identity. Afraid of the past and a dark history. Why is everybody always chasing we? So they cut off the roots from your family tree. Don't you see that's not the way? Way to be Jerusalem if I forget you. If I am not gone, come from my tongue. Jerusalem if I forget you. Let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do. Jerusalem if I forget you. If I am not gone, come from my tongue. Jerusalem if I forget you. So they caught up in their ways and the world let gone crazy. Them don't know it's just a face case of the Simon says If I forget the truth, my word won't penetrate Bob and I'm burning in the blaze but can't see through the haze Chop down all of them dirty ways The price that you pay for selling lies to the youth No way, not okay, ain't no way, not okay Ain't no one that could break my style Ain't no one that could hold me down Break my style, ain't no one that gon' hold me down. Oh no, I got to keep on moving. Stay Jerusalem if I forget you. Oh, I am not gonna come from it on Jerusalem if I forget you. Let my right hand forget what it's supposed to do. Jerusalem if I forget you. I am not gonna come from it on Jerusalem if I forget you. Oh. oh.